Okay, so um, this this talk, uh, which will be very short to allow lots of time for questions and answers, is based on a Vox column that Simon Evan and, and I wrote uh, in February, you'll notice before the new director general took over. And in this Vox column, we sent some unasked for advice to the director general. And uh, either by a coincidence or, or whatever, um, some of the things we said actually uh, got picked up it's probably just a, a question of her advisors thinking the same way as us, but I'd like to share with some of those things. But as background, I'm gonna first look at the current economic situation, which I think is a setting for the idea that the WTO is primed for a new launch into multilateralism, the current COVID situation, which has a particular resonance right now. And then I'll talk about the opportunities for restoring WTO centrality to the world trade system. Okay, so here's the economic situation. If you look at the graph over here on the left, you can see that manufacturing and trade at the world level are back to pandemic levels, but services are lagging. So these indicators, it's a little hard to see it on the screen, but basically you see they dive down when the, that, when the epidemic hit and have come back at an incredibly fast pace. Now, most of them are above the 100, which means they're back to where they were before. These are based on high frequency numbers, uh, monthly data. So the quarterly data, the official data isn't quite back here, but the high frequency data suggests that world trade is back already. In particular, this red line uh, shows the uh, volume of uh, world trade uh, taken as a whole. Now that's very uneven as those of you in Asia will understand very clearly, um, Asia, uh, East Asia and um, Europe and North America are very differently synced in this pandemic. But uh, the US is starting to pick up, Europe is starting to pick up, East Asia started to pick up a little while ago, but the rest of the world still is having lots of problems. And so that's shown on this right uh, graph here. This is the advanced economies are recovering faster to pre-COVID-19 growth rates. So what these are, these are uh, from the uh, IMF, it's the revision to cumulative growth rates that have been diminished. So of course, there, we've had a recession in 2020. So all these numbers are negative in the sense that they, they're, they've lost some cumulative growth. But you can see the blue bars, which are the advanced economies, this is 20, 2020, 2021 forecast for 2022, that their cumulative loss uh, is going to be much smaller than the uh, least, at uh, least uh, the lowest income countries, the emerging markets. And the red one is the emerging markets without China. And since that's so much higher, you can see that China is actually doing very well during, during this crisis. So I think that's the background. What we have is a world economy which is recovering, which is generally good for trade cooperation, but a very differentiated thing around the world with some of the emerging markets really lagging behind. Now, to come to the pandemic. So the left, left thing is the most recent data on uh, daily cases per 100,000 people with the reddest being the worst. And what you can see again is the pandemic is very different across the world with East Asia doing way better than North America, South America, and Europe. Africa, we honestly don't know what's going on there. It's, it's entirely possible that it's spreading or it's not spreading, but in any case, uh, so far it looks good there. But in South America, it's extremely worrying of, of the, uh, the, the, co the COVID is still a big issue and getting worse in a, quite a number of the South American countries. And on the right here, you see that the vaccination rate is very uneven, where North America, Europe, are doing okay on vaccination, but the rest of the world is not doing okay on vaccination. So with those facts as a background, I wanna make a very simple point that several people have made before, and that is it's not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. And there's a very clear reason for that. That is mutations are proportional to the cases, the number of cases. And that's why we continue to get new variants, for instance, a fairly recent one appeared in India, um, which can then cause new infections, uh, potentially re vaccine resistant infections in the countries that are already ahead. So until we really kind of damp down this thing everywhere, it's not going to be done. 
Now, what this does is create an opportunity for WTO centrality. And this is our unasked for advice to the director general. So first point is to think big. This is a historic moment for the WTO. For the last 25 years, the center of trade uh, liberalization and innovation has been shifting to regional trade agreements. But these crises, COVID, the global recession and climate change are multilateral problems that have to be solved at the world level. And that gives the WTO an occasion to get back in the driver's seat of the world trading system. Back 30 years ago, if you wanted to do something about trade, the first place you thought about doing it was at the GATT or the WTO was called back then. But subsequently things have sort of shifted away from Geneva, but now is a moment to move it back. So the idea here is to demonstrate that the WTO can play a helpful role in solving the world's most challenging problems to create momentum that it works again in Geneva and then hopefully restore the centrality and work on all the other issues. So there's three real issues to leverage here. First of all, COVID, as I've talked about a little bit. And here it's important to say that COVID, although it's mostly a health problem, it's also a trade problem. Because as I'll, I'll give you a quote from the Director General of the WTO about how important supply chains are. And many studies have, have looked into for personal protective equipment or vaccines or other forms of treatment of how international trade and in particular international supply chains have been critical in, in ramping up the production that's, that's been so essential in fighting this pandemic. So it's natural that the WTO take a key role in fighting the pandemic and be seen as doing so to join hands with the World Health Organization and be equally prominent in fighting the pandemic. Producing billions of vaccines, doses of vaccines, and that's what we need, and distributing them will require a very well-functioning trade system with multilateral cooperation. And that's the opportunity for the WTO. Now, the Director General has definitely got on to that message in part because she was involved with the vaccines before. The second is the economic recovery requires a trade recovery. And when we wrote this, our paper, our, <clears throat> well, when uh, Tetsu and I wrote our paper last year and Simon and Evan wrote our column this year, uh, that was less clear. The, the recovery is going, but it's very uneven. And it's important to make sure that protectionist instincts don't shut that down. And then lastly, once we start to move a little bit beyond the epidemic, uh, climate cooperation is moving to center stage. And again, uh, although it's not a new thought, climate is also a trade issue. In particular, Europeans and Americans are talking about carbon border taxes or car uh, uh, border tax adjustments, as they called it in the WTO. And so there will be big, big discussions about enhancing cooperation using things like tariffs, basically, or uh, taxes at the border. Okay, so this is uh, the advice to the WTO leadership uh, on COVID particularly. This is an historic chance for the WTO to be a global champion for saving lives. And if you go back far enough, if you know your history of the GATT, the GATT was, had a geostrategic role in the Cold War era. So it was way more than trade. And part of its importance in the uh, heads of state of countries all around the world was it wasn't just about small trade issues, it was a global thing. And that's where we could potentially get back on, onto it. WTO helps save lives on climate, on recovery, on climate, um, sorry, on, on COVID. Trade will be critical to defeating it, as I said. And we got to start by a push to keep the trade right, routes open for medical vaccines. That's the specific issue in which we can open the wedge to bring the WTO back into centrality. And if you, in a book that Simon and I published, he has a chapter with Alan Winters, and there's another chapter which has very specific ideas that I don't have time to go into. So this is the quote that shows that the DG gets it. I, I will skip over it in the interest of time. She's just pointing out that the global value chains are very important. And the other issues I, I'll leave for a question and answer, the climate cooperation, multilateral cooperation on digital trade, 
is, a, is another one which I haven't mentioned so far. People are very aware of digital now in extent that they weren't before, and that's another opportunity for the WTO. So thanks for listening, and I'll stop right there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard, uh, for a wonderful presentation, and it's a very good advice to new director general to the, of the WTO. There will be many issues uh, like uh, uh, COVID and the climate and the digital trade, and uh, and uh, you are always encouraging and uh, optimistic. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, then next, we're going to listen to uh, Professor Simon Bennett. Well, let me begin by uh, thanking the colleagues at Wrighty for organizing this webinar and to give us the opportunity to talk about how to revitalize trade cooperation. I'm going to build on the observations that Richard has made. You'll see a direct connection in the uh, first substantive slide that I'm uh, about to show you. So if you're thinking about the challenges faced by the WTO, uh, they, they manifest themselves, I think, in three well-known problems. But then I think I want to dig a little deeper and talk about what the underlying potential uh, causes are. So the well-known problems are the ones I've listed here. We have an appellate body, which is in abeyance, and this of course is uh, undermined the, the juridical aspects of the WTO, the enforcement function. The Doha round uh, was not a success, so the negotiation function has been uh, compromised. We did have the agreement on trade facilitation signed, but that is the only sort of multilateral accord that we've had signed of any uh, stature since uh, the Uruguay round. And we have a monitoring and the deliberation function uh, that is struggling uh, to provide uh, the sort of inputs which WTO members, governments need. So these are, I, I, these are symptoms of an underlying malaise. And the underlying malaise really has um, a number of aspects to this. The first uh, that we identify in the book is that there has been a lot of long-term scarring caused by the previous systemic crisis. And these, uh, we, we document and show how a number of the subsidies which have been put in place have not been unwound. Uh, and as a result, we had an accumulation of trade distortions uh, building up uh, like uh, grains of sand, almost thousands of grains of sand clogging up the system. On top of this, we have had the rise of China uh, and the geopolitical rivalry which has uh, gone with that. And then we also have uh, the structural changes in the world economy especially the expansion of the digital economy. Let me explain, why, I think, why that is particularly important because it calls into question the very relevance of the WTO. At the moment, we do not have uh, a particular specific agreement on digital matters at the WTO. We certainly have WTO principles which bear upon the digital economy, uh, but uh, unless we, until we get an accord on the digital economy, there are gonna be vast swathes of uh, the business community are going to wonder what the relevance of this organization is in the 21st uh, century. And of course, as Richard rightly pointed out, uh, we have um, uh, the ongoing COVID uh, pandemic, and in particular, the questions of vaccine production and distribution. So these factors, some of them are longer term, some of them are uh, deeper, some of them are much more proximate, have eaten away at uh, the system and its ability to function. What we want to do in our what we wanted to do in our book was to collect uh, suggestions from about uh, twenty or so leading experts on how the WTO could respond. And we asked the chapter authors to make specific recommendations, which we then co uh, collated and thought through and, and classified into three uh, groups. And uh, what I would like to do now is to summarize what the recommendations are. We recommend that, that the WTO start with confidence building measures and then follow with more substantive changes to uh, its operating procedures and importantly, its agreements. One very important group of recommendations relates to the ability of the WTO to react to systemic crises. The COVID-19 is the second systemic crisis the WTO has had to deal with in 15 years. And I think not everyone is happy with uh, the speed with which it reacted, as well as the ability to uh, muster international cooperation in times of trouble. Now, there are as some of the chapters in the book describe you know, institutional changes which would help facilitate meetings, dialogue, and alike uh, between governments. But uh, in terms of substantive uh, matters, where, as Richard has argued, there is room for negotiating a trade and public health initiative. This may not necessarily involve binding uh, obligations in the short term, but at least a commitment 
not to uh, frustrate supply chains. And we must go back to the drawing board and look at every single way in which we can facilitate the global, global recovery with international trade and investment. So this is a very good opportunity to revisit trade and, and uh, investment facilitation matters. The second a very important track to work on is to restore the WTO centrality in the trading system. I will not repeat what Richard has said. I think he's absolutely right to say that unfortunately the WTO has slipped from view in terms of uh, where people would like to solve problems and the uh, pandemic plus the other systemic questions I've raised earlier is a great opportunity for the WTO to get back in the game. When it comes to updating uh, the WTO rulebook, the first step actually is to assess what's working and what is not. And a number of the chapters in the, in the book uh, call for such assessments as a way of informing WTO members about uh, where there could be for room for further progress. But I think the deeper uh, point here is that we have to encourage the WTO members, governments, to start thinking about what they want this organization to achieve. And we fr I frame that deliberately in terms of what do we want this organization to achieve perhaps over the next 10 years. Recently, or perhaps uh, I should say in the Saudi G20, minister, uh, G G20 presidency, uh, the WTO members in the G20 got together and tried to identify common principles. And they had difficulty doing that, uh, which was uh, which is itself a very, fairly worrying. What instead we would like to do is to frame the discussion in terms of what needs to get done and what is the common core which we could align on, at least or which a number of the big players can align on. And it may be that not every imperative that uh, people want to accomplish uh, will necessarily make the final cut of the common core. And so we have to ask ourselves, right, which, which imperatives, which goals, which outcomes do we want 10 years from now that, uh, that we can all agree on? Now, Richard and I, Richard and I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this, and we identified eight imperatives which uh, we hear WTO members describing, and I will list them on the next uh, on the next slide. The key question is which of these eight imperatives command enough of a uh, following in order for them to go forward. And so instead of WTO members going to meetings and saying, we believe this organization exists to promote perhaps um, reforms towards a more market-based economy, um, and seeing that that argument uh, runs into a lot of opposition from other countries, the goal should be uh, to talk of is to try and find which of the imperatives everyone can agree on. And this will be important in order to set expectations about what this organization can realistically accomplish over the next 10 years. And this then will help rebuild the credibility of the WTO in the eyes of prime ministers and presidents who have, for the last 20 years have just seen this as this organization has largely been incapable of delivering. So what are those eight imperatives? We've listed them here. Uh, and this is taken straight from the book. Some of them are very old imperatives. That is encouraging countries to integrate further into the world trading system. Other imperatives like uh, trying to reduce uncertainty and binding policies. Uh, this is an old imperative as well. The market reform imperative that uh, I mentioned earlier, and, and which is of course one advanced by the United States, is one which probably would not um, get widespread support, or at least support a lot of the WTO membership. And so that might be an imperative which could not go forward. A fourth imperative we've listed is the need to be able to manage clashes between different capitalist systems. In the old days, we used to call this the interface problem. And in Japan had a special role to play here because of course it was the emergence of Japan in the world trading system and the frictions with the United States, which led people to worry in the 80s and 90s that there was a systems clash there. We have a different type of systems clash now, uh, but still the question arises, how do we manage the frictions between different types of capitalism? Another perhaps related point is how do we manage disruptions to the trading system? How do we encourage compliance uh, with, uh, with the WTO agreements. And of course, the best outcome is for countries to naturally comply, not to design uh, a, mach a machinery which necessarily punishes countries. The idea is to encourage countries not to break the rules in the first place. 
A seventh imperative is one which Richard and I have both emphasized, which is how can the WTO stay relevant in an era when we have climate change, the digital technology and alike. And the eighth imperative is for this organization to be able to manage crises better. And our suggestion is that uh, uh, WTO members and their ambassadors quietly sit down and begin to sort through these list of eight imperatives and to figure out which of them ha have enough support amongst the WTO membership. And this is essentially uh, what uh, they need to ally on, uh, align on. In other words, we have to think through what is the purpose of the WTO and what uh, purpose can guide the activities over the next 10 years. We then need to uh, communicate that this is the purpose of the WTO, signaling to national capitals, prime ministers and presidents, what is the intention to deliver? And then of course we have to follow through on this. So you can see that this is quite a, a deliberative process in order to restore the credibility of the WTO. Let me uh, conclude there by thanking you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Professor Aganet, and uh, uh, for the wonderful presentation. And I think uh, the message uh, resonated with uh, 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 Richard's uh, message uh, uh, in, 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 in some way, because uh, you mentioned that uh, we should come back to the purpose of the WTO and uh, looking into the next 10 years. And that, that was your message. And also, Richard mentioned that uh, think big. And so I think that illustrates uh, where the problem of the, the retail and the multilateral trading system and, uh, and uh, on your eight imperatives, I th personally thinking, I, I think uh, the uh, relevance imperative is the most, maybe, maybe most important. Anyway, thank you very much for, for your wonderful presentation.